Hey everyone, I hope that you all had a great month and you were able to get outdoors and explore a little bit of your home range. If you were able to get out fishing somewhere, go ahead and leave that in the comments section. I'd love to see where you went and what you caught. If you have a picture, that'd be even better. Well, we have another great show lined up for you today where we're going to explore a little bit about one of the most common fish to target here in New Brunswick, the trout. In today's installment of Exploring East, we'll learn a bit about the trout and its relative species in Crash Course. After that, we will discuss a little bit of the restocking program that we have here in New Brunswick in Conservation Corner. And to finish it all off, I have a really cool uh, rig that I've uh, hooked system that a friend of mine showed me uh, for fishing trout. And it's going to be an interesting little thing. I've set up a, sort of a river bottom here in an aquarium tank and we'll see how the two rigs are traditional and a two hook system work. So we'll take a look at that in Rig It. Lastly, of course, we'll show you a little bit of an adventure that we went on where we targeted some of these brook trout. We're also going to be giving away a few things. Uh, we have a new spinning rod. For those of you that want to go on a little trouting adventure and don't have a spinning rod, go ahead and add a comment in this video um, to let me know that you are interested in having your name in a hat for a spinning rod. We also have other smaller prizes. Uh, for instance, we have some spinners and and some uh, other piece of swivels, tackle, and also, oh, uh, a belt bait box, which if you fish trout, you will, you will find that you've thought about this. Like, man, I wish I could just have my worms right here on my belt. Well, I got the belt box for you. What most people call trout can be very confusing subject because the term trout has been used to historically identify some fish across a couple of different families. So let's talk a little bit of high school science class. I know, I know, just hold on. Exciting for me because I've been a high school science 10 and biology teacher for a number of years. So anyway, I'm going to give you a little crash course in the naming system. A group of living organisms or a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed. They can exchange genetic information and make offspring. In other words, it's a group of organisms that can make babies that can make babies. Each species has their own identifying name consisting of its genus and species name. For example, the brook trout that we are going to be chasing here in this adventure uh, scientifically is called Salvinius fontanalis. Uh, I know it's a mouthful, but we call it trout. Um, this isn't always the best to just call them trout because there are a lot of different types of fish and they're related to different parts of the family. So why am I all telling you this? Well, growing up, for example, I always learned that the brook trout was actually called a speckled trout, which does describe the trout quite well. It does have speckles on it, but so do a lot of other fish, some trout and some not trout, which we'll learn about here in a second. So here are the basics in very general form. If you want to learn more about trout and the species of trout that we're going to talk about and char and salmon, Go ahead and do a little research. They're really kind of cool fish. But in North America, there really are two native species that are originating from the Pacific uh, Western part of the, the continent. Rainbow trout and cutthroat trout are two native species in North America that really their native range is all along the Pacific and any drainage that from the Rocky Mountains over where it drains into the Pacific Ocean. Rainbow trout have since been introduced to waterways all across North America, and you will find them everywhere, including in New Brunswick. So don't be shocked if you catch a rainbow trout somewhere in New Brunswick. They're most noticeable because they have that lateral pink stripe that run down them. You'll be able to see them if you stop in at Bass Pro, swimming around the tank there. The cutthroat trout is uh, not around our parts. You won't find a cutthroat trout around here. Uh, I've heard of some populations being introduced and stocked in Quebec, I think is the furthest east, but they're typically found in the Rocky Mountains uh, westward toward the, the Pacific Ocean. These two fish have hybridized, and so in that part of the world, rainbow trout and Cutthroat trout uh, can make babies that have characteristics of both, so it's sort of hard to figure out sometimes what you caught. You could have a rainbow trout, uh, you could have a cutthroat trout, or you could have 
a hybrid that looks a lot like a rainbow and has a little bit of cutthroat in it. But you can see these fish, they're really distinguished by the red marks that kind of are on either underneath the gill plates of either one, which kind of look like it has a cutthroat. There is one other species of actual trout that you should know about, and it's from Europe, and it's called the brown trout. Uh, if you're interested in catching some brown trout, we do have populations of them here, and you can find them, it's no secret, in the St. John uh, Lake system, first lake, second lake, you'll find them in there if you wanna fish them, or the St. John River system, you can find them there as well. Brook trout and lake trout are actually classified as char. So you will find brook trout everywhere in New Brunswick. They're a cold water alpine type fish. Lake trout, you guessed it, you'll find those in lakes around New Brunswick. Trout are cold blooded. So temperature is probably the single most important factor to consider when you're trying to understand the behavior of this particular fish. When the water is too cold, they're lethargic and exhibit like hibernation type behaviors. Uh, fish biologists have determined that the trout prefer water temperatures uh, 56 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 13 to 15 if here in Canada. Uh, that's why trout around here are harder to catch in the spring, the early spring, because there is it's such cold water and they're cold blooded animals. So they're tucked away in the cover in slow moving currents trying to conserve energy and find the most opportunistic way to get food. They're visual predators and uh, they will move into that faster water or up into the shallows when they need to, to capture more uh, bigger items of food and take advantage of that. Also, temperature doesn't just affect the fish, it's, it highly affects the insect life cycle and the hatches, so that activity then drives uh, fishing behavior as well. Once the insect starts to hatch, it's a great time to start fly fishing for trout as well, and you'll see a little bit of that. I actually did a little bit and caught a, a trout on a fly, which is abnormal for me. Bottom line is that uh, early spring, uh, they, they hold in deeper pools ahead of rapids, and you'll likely find this beautiful fish uh, tucked in somewhere. They're hard to get. The problem is getting them to, to t make the effort to go get the food that you have in front of them. Changing temperature also determines a lot about the spawning behavior for trout. Uh, around here, the brook trout and the brown trout, they'll spawn as the temperature starts to drop back down toward their lower limit. So uh, they actually are fall spawners, uh, where rainbow trout and cutthroat trout actually start to spawn as the temperature increases in their, their comfort zone. So they're classified as spring spawners. The New Brunswick Fish Stocking Program is a program where they stock brook trout and landlocked salmon into New Brunswick inland waterways. They do this yearly and you can actually go on their website here and you can see their reports. You can click fish stocking reports and you can actually see where they have stocked, how many, and the size of the um, species that they introduced. There are a few regulations regarding this. They, they do... Um, let me just see if I can find it here. Fish stocking program. They do sort of recognize that stocking uh, fish, there there is an inherent sort of maybe risk of genetic fitness and disease that could go in through the natural and wild population. So to mitigate those, they actually have ground rules that they kind of follow in order to stock these fish. They only stock waters right here that have suitable conditions to support stocked fish. So they're not pressuring anything and they generally have supported this in the past and they're accessible to the public. So those are three kind of conditions that they need to check off in order to stock those those lakes and, and waterways that you'll see in the interactive map here in a second. They will not stock um, waterways that, are, that do have a good fishery um, that they can't support the the added uh, fish or that they they haven't in the past they've tried it and it didn't really work out so in the last one here it says they specifically for commercial benefit so that's kind of an interesting thing so this is generally for recreational fisheries to uh, help get people out and catching fish so there's a neat stocked waters interactive map that if you're interested in fishing brook trout this is a great way because one of the program goals is that they're accessible to the public. So if you take a look here, you'll see the stocked water body. And this is brook trout. So you're looking at the orange. 
So you'll see the legend over here with the stocked water body and tells you a little bit about what is being stocked. You can click the next button and overlay some, you know, information. If you want a topography map, you can do that or a Google, you want to do imagery. So let's just take a look at uh, some of these. Let's go down towards St. John. Let's see. Okay, here we're in Rockwood Park. So it's Lily Lake here, probably. Zoom in. Um, yeah, so here's Lily Lake, and this gives you all the details of the lake. And um, you can actually look a little bit more into the details of the the um, stocking. It takes you back to the chart that you could see the sizes and how many are put in. So if you're looking for a place to fish trout and you get your license and you want to check out one of these in your area, you can use this interactive map and you should be able to find at least an area that's stocked and is accessible um, by some means. There's the interactive map. I'll put a link to it in the description so that you can access it or you can find it on the department website. The gear needed to fish trout can be very basic. In fact, I remember as a kid just breaking off an alder branch beside the river and chasing those uh, brook trout with a string, a hook, and a little bit of worm. If you'd rather upgrade from a branch, you can uh, pick up one of these. As I use an open face. It's a light action um, spinning rod with a uh, you know, six to 10 pound line, eight pound line. I mean, you're not catching, brook trout are not huge, right? So you can use this. I like it because you can kind of cast into little spots with an open face, pretty easy. Um, so you can get this. In fact, we're gonna be giving away uh, a spinning rod if you just want to make a comment in this video that'll help us to determine who actually wants this so it's just a uh, what is it a stampede bass pro um, this was uh, a six foot six rod it's a two-piece and we're just giving it away so if you would like this and you'd like to have your name in a hat for that then go ahead and just leave a comment in the video so I'm gonna show you how to rig this up it's very simple uh, I use a swivel on almost all of my uh, my lines just to keep it from tangling and especially for doing small casts and things with an open face you want you don't want to have a whole lot of twist in the line so a swivel is a great way to do that and you can just do a swivel and a hook now I use these uh, snelled hooks they're they come pre-packaged and uh, they're, they're super easy. They have little bait barbs on them to keep the, wa the worm on them. Uh, they can, they're just pre-packaged. And so uh, you can get those and they can, you can hook those on the swivel, add your worm, and you're ready to go fishing. Uh, a lot of times around here, you will use a spinner and to attract the fish. So it's a little bit more than a passive type of fishing. It's a little more active where you will uh, attach a spinner onto your swivel and then use the snell line. So there's different types of spinners and spoons that you can use. Uh, small one, these ones are appropriately sized for the brooks around here. You don't need a big one. It's just to add a flash in the water as you're pulling it through and it will help attract those fish. So you can simply just grab the spinner, attach it to the swivel, and then if you get these pre-made hooks, you can also just tie on a hook. I mean, I just use them because they're super easy and they have those little bait barbs on the hook. So, and you're ready to go right there a, with a swivel, uh, spinner and a hook. We also will be giving away some of these spinners that we picked up and some swivels. So, and also one other thing that we're gonna be giving away is this handy little uh, how many times that I've been fishing and wished I had one of these comments or write a comment for this video and then we will use those people's names, put them into the draw for uh, these prizes. And so we'll get them off to you. Super easy to attach this under your belt, have your worms in here if you're doing trout fishing. Comes in handy. It's better than a bag. Anyway, we recently went fishing for trout and I used this setup and a friend of mine who was with me he used a different setup. And so what I want to do is I want to show you what that is. And I have the tank here because I wanted to see if what, what he had said they do actually works. And so we're going to take a look at what 
a worm on a hook looks like underwater to those fish. And this is the type of setup that I recreated. I think he ordered them somewhere, but they're easy to make. They were adjustable so that the front hook, it's a two hook system. So the front hook can actually slide up and down the leader. If you can see that up and down the leader so that you can attach various size worms and with two hooks. And so the idea is that with this adjustable that the worm can have a more natural look in the water as opposed to just a hook with a gob of worm on it. So we're gonna take a look at that. I'm gonna show you how to make one of these and then we're gonna put a worm on each and put it in the tank and take a look at it. So let me show you how to make one first off. And I'm just gonna use uh, some oversized things just because I want you to see what it's like. So th this is a more appropriately sized hook. Uh, they're probably number six hooks and they're just long straight shank hooks that I'm going to use for trout fishing but I'm going to throw in a couple big ones here just I suppose you could use it in different size as well uh, just so we can see so I'm going to use big thick line and big thick hooks so that we can actually see how to build this adjustable two two hook system for live bait and worms all right the first thing you're going to do is you're going to snip off a small section, probably six to eight inches long. You're going to need that to attach the top hook. Then you have uh, your leader line and I would go, you know, another 12 inches there to create your leader. We're going to put a, a loop at the top uh, when we're done because we'll do that when we're done to adjust the size. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to slide that hook on the leader line for the front hook and then you're going to attach the second hook. Now I have a video out there on the clinch knots, the polymer knots and the perfection loop. These are the ones you'll need here. Wet the knot but you should lubricate the knot to make sure that it seats properly. So you should have something that looks like this. So we're going to take this small piece that you cut previously, we're going to run it through the eye, make a loop, a decent sized loop with lots of in the tag and actually include the leader line so that it actually like wraps on itself here. So what you're going to do for snelling, you can check out some videos on snelling if you'd like, I can make one if you want, but you're just going to wrap five, six, seven times whatever makes you most comfortable and then when you're done poke the tag end through that end that you made and then pull pull your line so you should have a nice tight the tags off. So really you've just snelled this first hook onto the leader line like this and because you've snelled it on it's it's tight enough that it will move around on your leader and stay relatively uh, in the same position. So you could attach this onto one part of your bait and this hook onto the other part of your bait and know that you have two hooks in on your bait at all times. So the last thing you're going to do is to create a perfection knot and uh, if you remember how to do that from the video, which I think you do, you are going to create a loop like this, cut that tag off and now you have an adjustable, an adjustable double hook rig. So let's go ahead and we'll stick a worm on the smaller ones and we'll take a look to see what they look like. All right, so if I was baiting for a trout, I have a couple of worms I just picked outside. These are kind of big ones, but um, you would use this and you could thread the worm right on. So there is just the gob of worm on a single hook. So now let's thread on the 
this guy onto the back hook and the front hook. So let's do the back hook first, where we're gonna stick them on the side. So these, these worms do look different. This one is gobbed on and around the hook, whereas you can see the one with the double hook rig is actually more worm-like and, uh, and moving around. You can see him kind of moving around. So that would certainly attract trout more than just a gob of worm that looks like it would be just dead in the water. This one's moving around. Not any size, but... 